Welcome back everybody to International Criminal Law. This video is going to concern itself with the legal and substantive arguments and debates surrounding not only the ICTR, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, but also, and more pertinently, some of the legal questions which underpin the concept of the ad hoc tribunal in its entirety. This means we're going to be talking about both the ICTY and the ICTR uh, in this lesson, but talking about their relationship with international law, the idea of constitutionality of the ad hoc tribunals, and the legal basis and foundations from which they are established okay this will be done also in in relation to the idea of the ictr itself as well the previous lesson examined the historical background which pertained to the rwandan genocide as well as some of the issues which were present which concerned international criminal law which of course involved the concerns relating to the crime of genocide the crimes against humanities war crimes etc this lesson is going to talk about the role of the UN Security Council in this conflict in the establishment of the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. If you remember, when we talked about the ICTY, we talked about the process that led to its establishment, which led to or began with a number of UN Security Council resolutions, which ultimately leads to the establishment of the court itself. A similar thing happens when we talk about and reference Rwanda. We will also then start to talk about the legal justification and the jurisdiction for the tribunal itself. So one of the things that plays an incredibly important role throughout all of international criminal law, in addition to specifically the law pertaining to the ad hoc tribunals, is this idea of the UN Security Council. The Security Council plays an important role in it. It is, in fact, one of the um, justifications for the International Criminal Court to have jurisdiction over a particular issue. If, it is, if the Security Council refers the situation to the ICC, for example. This is also the case when we talk about the very um, clear uh, resolutions which were adopted by the Security Council in the number of stages that they were adopted by the, uh, in relation to the Rwandan genocide. OK, so despite the fact that it was very clear that um, a genocide had taken place in Rwanda during this period, the UN Security Council still took an approach of uh, adopting resolutions in a series of stages. There are a number of reasons why this may be the case. You, of course, have to be very careful in terms of referencing caution when it comes to international law and it comes to um, uh, the intervention of other states in an armed conflict situation like the Rwandan genocide. You then also have to uh, take into consideration some of the political and geopolitical implications of, of, of signing on to certain Security Council resolutions. States act for particular reasons in various different ways. So that is also something that has to be noted when we think about this. The first resolution from the Security Council, which uh, was specifically in reference to the Rwandan genocide, was Resolution 936 in 1994, which expressed grave concern at, uh, concern, sorry, at the continuing reports of, quote, systematic, widespread and flagrant violations of international humanitarian law. So... One of the things that needs to be noted is that this was actually an internal armed conflict. Okay, there was a, a civil war that had been taking place between the uh, between the People's uh, Rwandan um, Army, uh, I believe it was called, uh, and then the Rwandan government itself, as the genocide was taking place. So, at this point, international humanitarian law did apply in this particular context because it was an armed conflict. And there were, as you would probably understand, systematic, widespread, and flagrant violations of IHL which the UN Security Council wanted to express grave concern at the reports of. Reports obviously coming from the UN's uh, assistance mission to Rwanda, as well as the International Commission for the Red Cross and the Red uh, Crescent. That same year, in 1994, Resolution 955 provided for the creation of the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda under the Security Council's Chapter 7 powers. 
So straight away, you can see um, it only took two resolutions to establish the tribunal itself. Whereas if we think back to uh, what happened in uh, Yugoslavia, um, there were multiple resolutions. It took place in far more stages. But when it comes to the Security Council in reference to Rwanda, there was one that expressed grave concerns about the violations of international humanitarian law. And then there we have the second one, which establishes and provides for the creation of the ICTR. So, fundamentally, okay, both the tribunals that were established, both the ICTY and the ICTR, were established under the remit of the United Nations Security Council, under the powers that have been that are ascribed to the Security Council on the Chapter Seven. Okay, um, Articles thirty nine and forty one of the UN Charter provides for the Chapter Seven powers that are of relevance here. Okay, so Article 39 says the following. It says that the Security Council shall determine the existence of any threat to the peace, breach of the peace, or act of aggression, and shall make recommendations or decide what measures shall be taken in accordance with Articles 41 and 42 to maintain or restore international peace and security. The Security Council, as the name suggests, and as Article 39 um, implies with the UN Charter, is very, very determinative in the creation of or the determination of uh, uh, threats to peace, breaches of the peace or acts of aggression. They also have a number of powers and remits in terms of deciding what should be done and what actions should be taken in accordance with um, further provisions within the Charter itself to, quote, maintain or restore international peace and security. Article 41, therefore, is a very important element of this uh, particular uh, about of this particular um, power and this particular authority. It says, quote, the Security Council may decide what measures not involving the use of armed force are to be employed to give effect to its decisions, and it may call upon the members of the United Nations to apply such measures. These may include complete or partial interruption of economic relations and of rail, sea, air, postal, telegraph, radio, and other means of communication and severance of diplomatic relations. This provides a particularly broad open door scope to the kinds of things that the Security Council can actually implement in terms of uh, measures to try and restore peace and to ensure international security in a particular situation of armed conflict. The only thing it really explicitly says it cannot do is use armed force itself because it says it may decide what measures not involving the use of armed force are to be employed to give effect to its decisions and then it, it then says that in order to enforce those decisions it will it, it will call upon members of the united nations to apply such measures but this is fundamentally the kind of powers under which the Security Council can establish such ad hoc tribunals such as the ICTY and the ICTR, because it gives such a broad mandate to the kind of things that the Security Council can do. Assuming it has established and determined the existence of any threat to peace, breach of the peace or act of aggression, and then it has made recommendations, it has a number of uh, measures that it could do in order to, um, to ensure the implementation of said, uh, of said measures. So it is argued that the greatest achievement, it is arguably the case, the greatest achievement of both the tribunals, the ICTY and the ICTR, is the development and the addition to the broader corpus of international criminal law. Don't forget, since the Nuremberg and Tokyo International Military Tribunals, there was a relatively long period of time in which ICL didn't really do much. There wasn't really much that it was that was being done. There was references here and there. There was the introduction of new treaties, the Geneva Conventions, for example, and their additional protocols. There was also um, things like the the Russell Tribunal um, by Bertrand Russell on the on the legality and, and alleged violations of ICL committed um, uh, by the US in Vietnam, but nothing was really substantive in any meaningful sense. And so, really, with the end of the Cold War, and with these two very very major international crises that took place, we see a broader addition to the jurisprudence and the legal principles of international criminal law. They both made significant contributions, especially in the case of war crimes, and they also made a real significant addition to the focus of sexual offences in international criminal law, specifically the ICTR. 
the idea of sexual violence being part of um, genocide, crimes against humanity and war crimes was something that was talked about and was sort of de facto understood to be something that would fall under the remit of ICL, but was never actually codified or applied in the jurisprudence itself. Not really. Uh, and so it was these two tribunals that added a real um, uh, establishment of these um, uh, of these principles. We also see the first judgment of the crime of genocide against a specific individual be established in the ICTR, the prosecutor versus a case you case, uh, which we will get to in future lessons time. This represents again a very significant step. The Nuremberg tribunals and the and the Tokyo trials didn't have genocide on the remit. They were not referenced. They were referenced, or sorry, they were at least referenced by the prosecutors. But the London Charter for Nuremberg, for example, did not have genocide as one of its crimes. It was crimes against humanity, war crimes, and crimes against peace. Genocide enters the fray following the 1948 convention and the definition as established by Raphael Lemkin, but then is also established in the ICTY and ICTR charters, which we will get to in future lessons time.